And welcome back to Consumer Choice Radio, broadcasting across North America, syndicated on the radio uh, and right there on your podcast app. So we're speaking with Professor Jason Lusk. He is the Distinguished Professor and Head of the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. Uh, you can find his website and blog where he is very active over there on jasonlusk.com, J-A-Y-S-O-N Lusk, and also on Twitter under the same name. So Professor Lusk, thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, happy to chat. So the couple of things that we wanted to talk to you about, obviously, um, food inflation is big on the mind. I know you've been doing a little bit of work there. Uh, there's a lot of questions about food supplies internationally with everything that we see happening uh, with Ukraine and all of the rest. Um, if you could just sort of what's, uh, what's the main cause right now of what we're seeing with food inflation and, and really how are consumers feeling about it? Well, there's not a single cause, but but many causes that are coming together to contribute to the inflation that we're seeing. I kind of think of three interrelated buckets of drivers of the food price increases we're seeing. One is just general macroeconomic environment. So there's just a lot more money in the economy. If you look at, at just money supply, the amount of money that's sloshing around in the economy, that increased sharply at the end of the pan, at, at the onset mm -hmm. of the pandemic, largely in response to many of the government policies that um, you know aimed to, to shore up employment and consumer household budgets. But you know, when you cannot when you can't get out and travel or go out and eat, that money tends to flow into people's bank accounts. And indeed, you can see at an aggregate level at least a big increase in savings rates. So part of what's going on is just, you know, there's there's more money, the same amount of goods. And so that's just a classic definition of inflation. The, the value of each dollar falls when there's more dollars floating around. And so it takes more dollars to buy to buy stuff. So that's one answer, but that that's not unique to food. That's sort of a broad uh, explanation for price rises we've seen across the economy. The piece that it sort of helps dovetail a bit into food is that that's helps spikes, you know, generates extra demand. So consumers wanting more, willing to pay for more. You see that, you know, right now in cars and used cars, for example. But it's also we're, we're seeing it in food, Fit spending on food, both food at home and food away from home, is both up quite a bit since the uh, start of the pandemic. Even though there were some initial disruptions. Um, and so people are just, you know, they're just buying more food, willing to spend more on food, less price sensitive than they were uh, previously. And I think that's partly related to these income stories that I've mentioned before. Uh, the other part of the demand picture is international demand. So particularly for, for meat products. So the meat, meat prices have been, um, the increases in meat price explain a big chunk of the increase in overall food prices. And some of that's being driven by really strong demand from some of our international trading partners. So the U.S. is a net exporter of agricultural products and uh, particularly countries like China. Um, there was a surge in, in buying of, say, U.S. beef, which pulled up prices here at home. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, there's all the cost and supply side factors that, that come in. And, and some of that's labor related. Wages are up. Um, part of that's part, uh, 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 you know, related to this great resignation. So people are the food processors, food manufacturers, food distributors having a hard time finding enough employees. They've been increasing wages to try to get employees to show up. And those wages get reflected in the, in the food prices we see. Uh, in addition to the wages, just cost of ingredients. So agricultural commodity prices have been really uh, strong throughout the course of the last year. Some of that's due to weather issues. Some of it here more recently is due to events uh, around the world in UK, Ukraine and Russia. Um, and then, you know, fuel transportation has, has made, um, you know, transport, the, the increased fuel, fuel costs have made transportation more expensive. But even before the, the Ukraine situation, there was uh, some real backlogs in, in trucking. And I think across the board, talking to people in food processing and manufacturing, uh, they've had a hard time getting, just getting people to show up to pick up loads and take them from one place to another. So that's been a real challenge. So, you know, it, again, to kind of recap, there's not a, a single explanation, but rather a mm -hmm. combination of, of forces have come together to cause incre rate increases in food prices at a rate that we really haven't seen since the late 70s and early 80s. 
So I have a, a follow-up question for you on that because it's something that we've seen raised is is herbicides, herbicide shortages or pushes to limit their use. Um, what does that mean in practice for farmers? How important are herbicides for farmers? Will that um, put additional pressure upwards on pricing? Um, the answer is yes. So I think one, one thing to keep in mind is I think some people get a little uneasy when they think about herbicides being used in agriculture. Um, you know, are they safe? Uh, what not? Uh, maybe a view that I see articles sometimes that farmers are, you know, dousing their fields with uh, herbicides. Um, this is a, this is a cost for farmers. That's an expensive mm -hmm. input, and so farmers don't want to use herbicides unless they they provide a benefit to them. So there are a couple of benefits they provide. One is it increases the yields, so they can produce more, more, more food, more crop on a given amount of land. Um, and that increase in production, that increase in yield is, is more than enough to offset the cost of that fertilizer. Otherwise, they would do it. One of the other things, and this is maybe a bit counterintuitive for some folks, it does have some environmental benefits. So low-till and no-till farming technologies means that you know, you're not running a, a tractor over the field and disturbing the soil, which can result in soil runoff and other things. Those practices become more um, become easier for farmers to adopt those no-till practices if they have access to certain herbicides that can control weeds, because that's the reason the farmers are plowing those fields often is to control weeds. And if they can control mm. weeds in other ways, then it enables them to adopt these, these production practices that do have some environmental benefits. And you're right. So there, there have been some, some significant price increases in a lot of agricultural inputs, herbicides included. One of the big controversies these days uh, is around the use of uh, glyphosate, which is you know the brand name that people know of is probably Roundup. There have been some mm -hmm. lawsuits. Some food companies have, have made pledges to move away from that. Um, you know, I guess all good except the question is what are farmers going to use instead because mm -hmm. it's not like they're not not going to use a herbicide so if they're not going to use uh roundup what what's the alternative and unfortunately i think many times the alternatives are either less effective or or slightly higher levels of toxicity i mean all these have to be approved by the epa and usda to begin with so that they're, they're safe for human consumption but um, glyphosate is a class of of herbicides that you know was really much safer than many of the ones that, that came before them. So, um, you know, I understand people's concerns. I think we always want to evaluate the risks, but I think some of the, the paranoia around um, that particular herbicide didn't consider what the alternatives were. <laughs> like what's going to yeah, come in course. if you don't use that one instead. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, one, one thing that we've often seen in our work is that we're going against uh, many different non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, that are putting up a lot of huff and puff about many of these issues, and particularly around herbicides, around pesticides. We've just seen that there's little to no connection to reality of how it actually works for farmers, and unfortunately, a lot of misinformation. And like you just said, what are kind of any alternatives uh, that, that would exist? Because one thing that we're very bullish on is is technological progress and things getting better, more tools available for farmers. And all of that helps consumers because it helps prices go down. It helps us to have more adequate supplies, more yields, all of the rest. You know, if, if we had like a sort of a world without these, what would that look like? And would there be any tools? You know, is this something to where we can use masses of ladybugs or anything like this? Or is that even possible? Yeah. I mean, I work at a, a agricultural research university. So a big fan of investments in science and technology, and, and but more broadly, just entrepreneurship and innovation in the food and ag space. You know, we, we have big, big food problems. I don't disagree with that at all. You know, climate change, I already mentioned soil erosion, sometimes nitrogen and water. Um, and so the question really is, how, how are we going to make headway dealing with those problems? And I think imagining some utopia where there are no insects or no weeds is not particularly helpful or, or magical thinking that of course we uh, you know that there are just production practices out there that are you know easy to adopt and that are costless to adopt for consumers that they control those problems. They're just, they're just no simple solution. So I, I do think about trying to invest in that science and innovation as a way to deal with those. You mentioned ladybugs. Yeah, actually there, there's a whole active area of research around integrated pest management. 
trying to use, you know, quote, quote unquote, natural, even though nothing really all that natural about it, but, um, you know, competitive insects to control some of those. GMOs uh, was a big buzzword that, you know, does create mm-hmm. a lot of controversy sometime, but, but, you know, a GMO is not a single thing. It's just a tool. Um, yep. It can be used for a variety of different things. One of the ways in which it's used is to, um, you know, enable certain plants to produce its own pesticide. So um, BT corn, BT refers to uh, a compound that, that you know, when, a, when corn is given the genes to produce it, it can, it can produce this BT and, and it, that, that, you know, protects that corn against certain insects that want to eat it. Incidentally, I think, you know, one thing that might be useful to know, BT is an, is an organic compound. It's approved, it's an a, approved pesticide in organic production but somehow people get really upset about it when you know the plant's producing itself versus when a farmer's just spraying it on the field. But it's the same chemical compound, has the same effect. Actually, it's not toxic to humans, but it is toxic to uh, you know, certain kinds of bugs that want to eat mm-hmm. eat those plants. So that's an example of, of a kind of innovation to control for uh, insects in a way that actually has significantly reduced insecticide applications. Uh, so on the question of yields, because I think it's important always to frame what this looks like in terms of the alternative. Um, our colleague Bill Wirtz has done some work on this, and he's described some of the pressures from NGOs as essentially pushing for what would be a giant step backwards in terms of yields. But I'm curious if you could walk our listeners through what exactly some of that looks like in terms of the reduction in yields for basic crops if we were to adopt some of these anti-GMO policies or maybe cave to some of what I would view as the hysteria over herbicides and things like that? Yeah, I think one way to get a sense of the magnitudes here, because you know, we could talk about how many bushels per acre, but I don't think people have a good sense of what that means. Sure. One, one way to think about it is, is if we backed up, you know, about 40 years or so and said, did a little thought experiment, let, let, like let's imagine we want to enjoy the amount of corn, let's say that we actually produced and enjoyed last year, but we wanted to do that using, you know, 1950s or 1960s yield. Mm-hmm. How many more acres of corn would we need to plant? And the answer is we need to like double or triple the amount of acreage, you know, planted to corn. Um, wow. You know, I've done those same, you could do the similar thought experiments in all, all facets of agriculture with, uh, you know, you know, dairy or cattle or, or chickens. I mean, you get similar kinds of answers that you, you know, you, we would need in a case of chickens, if we went back to the, to yield, like the you know, amount, of, amount of pounds per bird, if we went back even to the 1980s, we'd need a, a billion more chickens to meet the, the current demand that we have there. So you think about what that means, you know, doubling the acreage of corn or having a billion more chickens and all the environmental demands that would create for the water, for the, for the land, for the pesticides, you know, pesticides, for the uh, fertilizer. And those things we're able to save, like we don't need those anymore because we found ways to be more productive, to produce more corn from each acre, to get each animal to put on a little more weight a little faster, uh, is improved genetics. Um, in the case of animals, it's improved diets, improved housing. In the case of plants, um, it's also you know genetics, but also management practices and access to certain herbicides and otherwise. That, that all those innovations, I think, come together to really produce a a, a food world that is is actually quite uh, contrary to most people's perceptions of it. We eat better, we eat more, we eat more affordably than we ever have. Not only in uh, in comparison to other parts of the world, but in comparison to human history. Food has never really been more abundant and more affordable than it has been today. And I think that's in large part thanks to the fact that we we have messed with nature. We didn't just take the world the way it was. We found uh, ways to improve upon it. And I think we're a lot better off for it. We certainly could not support the, the, the population size that we have today with the kind of agricultural practices that, that were in use in the 1940s and 50s. That's probably one of the most well-rounded and articulate defenses of innovation in agriculture that I've heard. So we definitely want to have you on again, if we can. Uh, Professor Lusk, uh, pleasure talking to you. Uh, Hopefully we can point uh, some of our listeners over to your website and your research. And uh, yeah, continue with with all the great stuff. This is a very good knowledge, I think, for a lot of people. Thanks for having me on.